My name is Marcus. I'm a born-again believer. Um, I was saved by believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who rose on the third day. He died for our sins. And um, I'm doing a study on regeneration as taught by Calvinists. Um, I'm going to expose that uh, the regeneration, the way that they teach it, is actually false. It's heretical. It's actually um, doesn't align with the Bible. And I'm also going to talk about um, the misteaching of sovereignty and how um, there's a false... Um, comparison, this dichotomy between about uh, God's will versus man will, as if um, there's some type of contradiction if you say that you believe the gospel and you actually had uh, the ability to believe, that all men have that ability to believe, and that the false teaching that God has to grant you or enable belief, um, and he does that in only certain men whom the Calvinists say are the elect. Um, so I'm going to challenge that. And I'm going to address that using the Bible as a Berean shit. So um, I'm going to start by letting John Piper explain his position. Our host is pastor and author John Piper. John, something in the human soul seems to crave control, even in spiritual matters. We want someone to tell us what to do so we can just go do it and get on with life. But when it comes to regeneration, new birth... Would you say it's not up to us? Right. It's no more up to us than my grandson, who was born two days ago, than it was up to him to get out of the womb. In other words, birth is something done to us, not something we do. It is something that we react to. And the first cry of the newborn baby in Christ is faith. And so I would never write a book on how to be born again, because that's writing a book for babies on how to get out of the womb. But I would write a book on how to be saved, and that's faith in Jesus Christ. But I've never met a believer there probably are some, who, when you ask, how did you come to Christ, really wants to take credit for it. Okay. Um, I want to establish, first of all, this is uh, John Piper, and uh, you can find this video on YouTube. It's called John Piper Regeneration, Man's Responsibility or God's, right? Um, first of all, he's setting up a straw man argument, because Jesus Christ said, you must be born again. Saying you must be born again is not the same as what must I do to be saved. All who are saved are born again, right? All the people who are saved are born again, for sure. But he's equating being born again with the gospel message. And he's equating coming to Christ, meaning believing the gospel, hearing and believing the gospel, with being born again. He's making the two inseparable as if they're actually the same thing. Believing the gospel and being born again um, is what happens after a person believes the gospel. And of course, that is a work of God, right? Because you can't force God to give you his spirit. But God tells men, calls all men everywhere to do what? Repent and believe. And when the Bible says repent and believe, it's you don't believe, so what is God asking, telling you to do? Believe. So you don't believe, you need to repent and believe. Um, what false churches do is they change the definition of repent to mean something more than simply, you know, you don't believe, so you need to believe. Repent and believe. You don't believe, believe. Right? So again, the, the uh, example I always give is if you are, say, working too hard, and I say, your doctor says repent and rest, it means stop doing the work and rest. Well, the Bible says repent and believe. It means you may be doing something else, believing a false gospel, doing all kinds of works, and the Bible says repent and believe the gospel. So that's what you need to do. Believe the gospel. Sir, what sir, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's simple as that. So this is a false argument. I, I've never talked to anybody who wants to say that they 
really provided the decisive initiative and the decisive work. Almost every believer, it seems, and I think this is because of God at work in them, even if the theology is not all there, every believer, by virtue of the Spirit within them, wants to give God the credit for saving them. For Okay, this is another, again, this is just bad arguments all around. He says they have the decisive initiative, right? And the decisive work. First of all, um, it says, Jesus Christ says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So the initiative is the Holy Spirit, which reproves all men of unbelief. If you look at John 16, uh, 9, and it talks about through John 16, I believe 7 through 9, it talks about the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus Christ says, needful that I go, because if I do not go, I will not send the comforter unto you, right? And when he comes, he will, what, reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment, What's the sin? Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I return to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So for him to say, provide the initiating work, well, no, no man can say they provide the initiate the initiation because the Holy Spirit is the one that reproves us, right? He draws, Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So all men are, are drawn unto him via the Holy Spirit, and what can you do? You can either, you can resist the Holy Spirit. That's what the scriptures say. And if you resist the Holy Spirit, resist the Holy Spirit, resist the Holy Spirit, meaning you harden your heart to the gospel message, at some point you've done what? You've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And that's the unforgivable sin. It's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So this this lie that um, just because you say you believe the gospel that you are providing the initiating work. No, you're not providing initiating work because the Holy Spirit is reproving man of unbelief, of righteousness, of judgment, of, of, um, of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And what is the sin? Again, John 69, of sin because you believe not on me. So that's, that's just an error. Secondly, he's talking about the work. Well, the scripture says to he that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the, un justified the ungodly. His faith is counted counted as righteousness right so is faith considered a work no because if faith was considered a work it wouldn't start out by saying to he that worketh not but believeth on him that's jesus that justifies the ungodly his faith is what counted so is is faith righteous or is it counted as righteousness well, obviously, it's counted as righteousness, right? He became sin who knew no sin so that we may be made the righteousness of God through him, right? In him. So obviously, faith is one, not a work. And then two, faith in of itself is not meritorious because it's not considered righteousness. It is counted as righteousness. So he's wrong on all three points. So he's making this argument. It's a false argument to begin with. Awakening. So here you have one person listening to the sermon, and their brother sitting next to him listening to the sermon, and one is awakened and sees the spiritual beauty of Christ. The other one looks at the other one like, what's with you? And doesn't see anything. What's going on there? Is that just innate wisdom, innate smarts, innate sensitivity to spiritual things? It's not innate. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible says, and God makes us alive together with Christ. So God, in his sovereign mercy, put his hand on that person and quickened them, wakened them, caused them to be born of God. So this is a blatant lie. Um, I mean, it's all, this is a blatant lie. The other lies are subtle lies because Satan is subtle. This one is a blatant lie. He is basically saying, so if you have two people, right, and you're going out and you, um, one, he doesn't even talk about hearing the gospel, really hearing the gospel. He's saying basically that a person has to be awakened by God first, right? God awakens them. He says, quickens them. Well, what are you quickened by? Scriptures say if you're quickened, you're quickened by the Spirit, right? If you're quickened, you're quickened by the Spirit. So what you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, if you're quickened by the Spirit, that means you have the Spirit. 
which means that means you're born again. But wait a minute, how can you be quickened and regenerated by the Spirit and be born again before you even believe the gospel? So he's basically saying that you get the Spirit of God not even having heard the gospel. You just, you just get the Spirit. And that enables you to believe, right? But let's 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 see how that works because uh, let's see. Um, the scriptures say, the scriptures say in Romans eight nine, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's Romans 8, 9, right? So he's basically saying that God makes you belong to him before you even hear and believe the gospel. Well, here's the problem with that. Um, the problem with that is if you look at um, Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom af also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Wait a minute, how can you be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise if, according to John Piper in Calvinism, you get the Spirit and then you believe? Well, okay, well, that's direct contradiction to God's word in Ephesians 1, 13. It says, after you, it says, in whom also you trusted after you, when did you trust in him? After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when after that you believed, you were sealed, right? So it's saying, you heard it, then what did you hear? The gospel, then you believed it, and then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And if you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to him. So this lie that you're regenerated by the Spirit before you actually hear the gospel and believe it is just that. It's a blatant lie. And then, by the way, it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession into the praise of his glory. So this, this straw man and this lie that uh, what, the, what the Calvinists do is they teach dead means you can't even hear and believe the gospel. When dead just means you're just... You're outside of Christ. That's all that means, right? Because life is found where? In Jesus Christ, right? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Well, there's the salvation is found in no other, no other. It's only in Jesus Christ. So it makes sense. But Calvinists make this false, this illogical um, argument about, you know, you're dead. And dead means you can't even believe the gospel. Well, according to Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that, that's not true. It's, it's clearly not true. Immediately, their eyes saw the beauty, their faith reached out and embraced, and that's what they experience. The new birth is the prior, miraculous, subconscious work by which they were enabled to see and savor and embrace. And therefore, we must pray. I tell you, I've prayed for my own children, especially one of them who took a detour away, away from Jesus. And I just prayed, oh God, do a decisive, regenerating work. I didn't. Wait a minute. So he said there was a, he, one of his youngest children took a detour away from Jesus and he prayed for him to do a decisive work. A decisive, regenerating work. Now... If he took a detour from Jesus, are you saying he wasn't saved to begin with? Right? Because he says, if you have not my spirit, you're none of mine. But that means if you have the spirit, you are, you do, you belong to Jesus Christ. Right? And so I'm a little confused. If you're born again, what do you got to be born again twice? So if, <laughs> how do you, if, he, if born again means you're a son. Being born again means you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, and through Jesus Christ you have what access to the Father, right? 
So if you've been born again and you have the spirit, that means you have access to the father. And Ephesians 2.18 says, um, now, therefore, you are no more strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Right. So you're a stranger before you have the spirit. You heard, believe the gospel. You got the Holy Spirit. Once you got the Holy Spirit, it says, now, therefore, you are no more strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Right. You are known by God. Not only are you known by God, but because it's the spirit, the seed is the actual spirit of God. You become foreknown because that's the spirit, which is the spirit of God. So how John Piper can say he prayed for his son that took a detour. Um, how do you take a detour if you're sealed in Jesus Christ and you're born again? What, what Are you confusing the flesh with the spirit? Let's continue to listen to him. That God keep his distance and leave it up to my son to come to Christ. I say, break in, crash in, take out the heart of stone, give the heart of tenderness. And that's all new birth prayer. Mm -hmm. I think we... Okay, um, here's another lie with uh, Calvinism. They talk about this heart of stone. Um, this is a big lie. You got um, to really pay attention to words. Um... You really, really got to pay attention to words because what happens is people will lie. And um, if you look at um, Ezekiel, this is why different Bible versions make a big difference. If you have a heart of stone, meaning your heart is completely stone, that means... Um, your heart is hardened in unbelief, meaning you will never, you, you, you passed up your chance, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and you will not believe the gospel. That's the case where you've hardened your heart, and then God has hardened it where you, because you continually hardened, God has kept hardening it along the way according to your unbelief, right? You harden it, and then God just hardens it where you, where you hardened it at. That's what happened with Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh saw all these miracles, chose not to believe. God says, okay. Harden your heart there. And his heart progressively got hardened. Right? That's why when you read in Romans, it says, Wherefore God gave them up to the hardness of their own heart. Right? Right? So, God giving up on you, that's when your heart, when God gives up, meaning that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that's when your heart is completely stoned. But before that, if you read Ezekiel eleven nineteen. 19, you read the King James Version says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. And I will give them a heart of flesh. Stony heart. Why is it a stony heart? Well, because people's hearts are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Right? But when you start out, are you the worst? Are you the, are you all the, are you the, uh, is a baby's heart hardened by the deceitfulness of sin when he's a baby? The scripture said, he that knoweth, knoweth and doeth not, to him it is a sin. Well, a baby doesn't know, right? So, but as you get older and you become aware and you do things that you know are di directly in disobedience to God, namely the gospel, um, then your heart becomes hardened because you're hardening your heart to the gospel message. With love and kindness have I drawn thee, right? And then if you, as you resist and resist and resist, your heart becomes hardened and hardened and hardened, right? Because a lot of people don't want to just believe that salvation is by grace through faith, and so they want to do works. And so what they do when they want to do works is what they're, they're doing is they're denying uh, Jesus Christ. They're rejecting the, the, the gift of um, eternal life. They're rejecting the gospel message, right? That Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose the third day according to the scriptures, according to 1 Corinthians 15. So you have a stony heart because every everyone has sinned. So you have a stony heart. But to have a stone heart, heart of stone, means you're completely reprobate. And so God takes out the stony heart and gives them, what does he say? I give them one heart. Why does he say he gives them one heart? Well, because they're sealed in Christ, right? Colossians 3.3, 3, ye are dead in your life. 
is hid with Christ in God. Well, if your life is hid in Christ with God, Jesus Christ walked the perfect walk, right? So you get that heart of Christ, right? David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David believed and David was saved. So everyone who's, who, who's that's why we're called the household of God. That's why we're called the body of Christ. Because the spirit, it's, God gives us one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism of what? The Holy Spirit. You have one spirit. All believers are in one spirit. And all those believers are in Christ, the household of God. And Jesus Christ is perfect and has a perfect heart, a pure heart. And that's why it says he purifies our heart, what? By faith. Now, if you read the perverted Bibles, the NASB, the ESV, it says, and I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and I will take out the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Right? That's wrong. It's not a heart of stone means you're reprobate. And God's not taking out your heart of stone because you, you that means you hardened your heart and then God finally hardened your heart in unbelief because you rejected the gospel to the point of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So that's a lie. And that's in the NASB and the ESV. Again, stony heart. Not heart of stone. So let's let's continue to listen to John Piper. Pray for regeneration. We pray for new birth so that people can believe. They don't believe so that they can be born again. They're born unto a living hope so that they can believe. They wouldn't believe. Okay, so this is obvious, this is an obvious lie. I just read to you Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. And it says, after ye heard the gospel of your salvation and believed, then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then the scriptures say, if you have not my spirit, you, you're none of his. Right? So you, John Piper is saying you belong to him. You belong to Jesus Christ before you believe the gospel. And he's saying you couldn't believe the gospel unless you have the spirit. But wait a minute, if you got the spirit, that means you are already born again. And if you're born again, that means you're already in Christ. But wait a minute. If you didn't believe, that means you haven't accepted what Christ even did for you. You haven't believed the gospel. So why is it why is Ephesians 1 12 to 14 saying it's the gospel of salvation? If you don't even have to believe that before you're born again and sealed in Jesus Christ. That would actually put sin in Jesus Christ. And also what's amazing about that, if you look at John 16, 9, where it says, he says, Jesus says, I, I must, send, I, I must uh, go so I can send the comforter unto you. And he says, and he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And then it says, of sin because they believe not on me. So the sin that sends every man to hell is because they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is ironic because the Calvinists say, well, wait a minute, Christ didn't die for everyone. Well, how can it, if Christ didn't die for everyone, how can the sin be not believing on Jesus Christ? If he didn't die for you, then you shouldn't believe what he didn't do for you, right? It would be a sin for you to believe the gospel because if he didn't die for you, then the gospel doesn't apply to you and thus you shouldn't believe it. And then Jesus Christ should not say that the comfort is reproving you of unbelief. John 69, of sin because they believe not on me. And if Jesus Christ is the one who's withholding faith, meaning he's stopping people from believing and sin and not believing is the sin, then that means Jesus Christ is authoring and causing the sin. He's actually causing them not to believe in them. So he's actually making them sin, which is just heresy and lunacy uh, to the nth level. So, you know, you know that that is wrong. That's incorrect. That's a lie. It can't be true. If God hadn't broken into their lives, raised them from the dead, given them a new heart, enabled them to see the beauty of Christ. Do you think that we'll ever resolve this tension between God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, and those who are pulling each way? Yes. In heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that's the trick of the devil, right? Um, you know, in... Calvinism, when they can't reconcile the Bible, what they do is they call it attention. You have, that's the code word for, look, it doesn't make sense. We can't reconcile it, but what we're going to do is wrap it around a lot of 
you know, fluffy language. We're going to use bigger words. We're going to, you know, um, we're going to play off the fact that we go to, went to Bible school. We're going to call ourselves authors and Bible teachers. We're going to um, try to um, stand on tradition of other people who aren't even in the Bible and say, um, refer to their books like we want to sell our books. We're going to refer to their books because we're book pellers for profit, you know, peddling the gospel for profit. And um, so because of that, they they want to tell you, well, you, you, you this is just a great mystery you can't know. Uh, actually, it's not a mystery. I'm sitting here talking to you, and I know, and I'm sure there's other brothers and sisters in Christ who do know. The reason these guys don't know is because they're blinded by tradition. They do not they do not believe, obviously, they don't believe the gospel. Because so far, John Piper, even in this message, has not even given the gospel. As according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins was buried, rose the third day according to the scriptures. That's what it is. And so he hasn't even given you the gospel message yet. I think probably it can be resolved to a significant measure here. If you read the very best analyses of it, Jonathan Edwards' Freedom of the Will, his book, The Freedom of the Will, is as good as it gets. And I think Edwards comes to a pretty close solution to how those two things can fit together. But I find, practically, that lay people are not by and large going to read that heavy-duty book, and that we are going to live with mystery in our finiteness, and that we need to make sure that we draw the mystery line in the right place. Now okay, so this is, again, this is the Pharisee in him, right? Lay people, um, he, you know, lay people aren't going to read this. Wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say test all things? Right? Didn't it say um, the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians that they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so? Right? Prove th these things? Well, how come John Johnny Piper here is not referring you to the scriptures? He's not referring you to the scriptures. He's referring you to a man's book. I mean... How hypocritical is that? The guy is referring you to a man's book. And it says, you know, lay people aren't going to read it. It's like reverse psychology to say, I'll read it. I'm going to go buy Jonathan Edwards' book. And, of course, when they introduced Johnny Piper here, he was what? Teacher and what? Author. Same thing for uh, John MacArthur. Same thing for all these guys. They're all authors, right? Everyone's going to be an author, right? But I thought the scriptures were sufficient, right? I thought the scriptures were profitable, right? So the man of God may be right, fully equipped. According to these guys, you can't be fully equipped. You need to go and do what the Jehovah Witnesses do. You need to get some companion piece to go along with the Holy Scriptures because I guess God just didn't cover it enough and there's this great mystery and that causes this tension and that can only be clarified through the Pharisees. I find that a lot of people agree that there's mystery, they just don't agree what the mystery is. And you stated it absolutely right. The mystery is not between the sovereignty of God that governs all things, including the will of man, on the one hand, and free will, on the other hand, which has us being absolutely self-determining. That's not the biblical mystery. The biblical mystery is between God, sovereign over all things, governing all things, including the will of man, on the one hand, and our accountability and our responsibility, on the other hand, to will what we ought to will, even though we don't have absolute self-determination. That's the mystery. And yeah, so he, that's called double talk. He's saying, you know, we don't have absolute, we, we need, to, first of all, the guy just said you're regenerated. He said you were born again. Okay. So now he's confusing the, the spiritual birth with obviously the physical birth. So now the question I have for anybody who doesn't seem to recognize this, the, two, the two natures, which obviously Apostle Paul recognized the two, two natures, because Paul, Apostle Paul recognized the fact that he still sinned, right? Apostle Paul recognized that, right? Uh, Apostle Paul recognized that. In fact, um, in 
in Romans 7. Um, Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, he says in Romans 7, 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I do, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. What is Apostle Paul saying? He says, that that I hate, that I do. That's basically saying, look, I'm doing stuff that I know I shouldn't do. I know I shouldn't do these certain things that I, you know, uh, I shouldn't sin, but I am sinning in my flesh because I am carnal, right? He says, then, if, in 16, he says, if then I do that which I would not, I can send unto the law that it is good. Of course, the law is good. No one's questioning whether the law is good. But are you saved by keeping the law? No. Scriptures say what? If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in what? Christ, Christ died in vain. Right? Right? Obviously, it doesn't come by the law because he died and he rose again. Of righteousness because I, what? Go into my father. He rose from the grave and returned to the father. Christ fulfilled the law. Right? Christ fulfilled the law. Do you fulfill the law? No. That's why you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where your faith is counted as righteousness. So it says here, he says, uh, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What is that sin dwelling in him? Is that sin dwelling in his, dwelling in his spirit, which is the spirit of God? Or is that sin dwelling in his, in his flesh, his carnal flesh, the old man? It's obviously his carnal flesh. And he's saying that that spirit dwells in him. He didn't say it's just something I do. He's saying that spirit dwells in me. You got to understand that once you sin just once, your flesh is corrupt. But when you're quote unquote born again, is your is your flesh born again? No, it's the spirit that's born again. It's just a new spirit. You've been regenerated of the spirit, right? And that spirit cannot sin. Look at 1 John 3, 9 in the KJV. Versus the corrupt in ASB and First John three nine in the KJV he says he that is born of God cannot sin because his seed uh, remaineth in him and he cannot sin. Well, in the perverted version it says he that is born of God uh, cannot practice sin because <laughs> his seed remaineth in him and then it says he cannot sin. For in fact, in ASB contradicts itself in First John three nine. Look at the first part of it and look at the second part. First part says you can't you cannot practice cannot continue practicing sin or something of that nature. Then the second part says you cannot sin. So which is it? Is it practicing sin or cannot sin? It doesn't even make sense. But you know, KJV has it correct because look, here's a question I have for you. Are we are all believers of one spirit or not? Think about that. Aren't we of one spirit? We're the it's the body of Christ. Right? So we have the one spirit, right? Of the household of God. So if you have that one spirit, which is it which is God's spirit, can God sin? For you to say that the spirit can sin is to basically say that God is sinning. You're saying that the Holy Spirit is sinning, if you were saying that the, the spirit sins. So you need to separate out the two, right? And that's why Colossians 3 3 says, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. What part of you is dead? Well, that would be the flesh, right? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me, right? So they don't need, Calvinists don't even recognize that as being a fact. So he says, no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Because God doesn't look at your fleshy man as, as you anymore. He looks at the new man, which is the spirit man. That's the part that belongs to God. That's the part that's going gonna to go to heaven. 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, it actually says it directly. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, he's clarifying, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, 
but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. He just told you it's in his flesh. Now, if I do that that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He just told you again, sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What's the inward man? That's the spirit man, right? The spirit, right? But I see another law in my members. What's the members? That's the flesh. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Right? Because do you have your glorified body yet? No, it awaits you. But are you of the spirit of God? Yes, because if you have not the spirit, you're none of his. So the question for Johnny Piper is, Oh, do you not have the spirit? You keep claiming you were generated and have the spirit. So if you have the spirit, are you saying the spirit sins? Because if you're saying the spirit sins, you're saying Christ sins. But yet, again, you're confused because you think that you can have the spirit before you believe the gospel in direct contradiction to Ephesians 1.13, which makes absolutely no sense. And then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Seems like Paul is understanding the two natures, the difference between the fleshly man and the spirit man. He's understanding that the flesh man, the fleshly man, sin dwells in the fleshly man, and there is a war going between those two. But of course, who wins that war? It's always the spirit man, because Colossians 3, 3, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. Why does your life need to be hid with Christ and God if you're not if you stop sinning in your flesh? You don't, that's why. So uh, let's go back to Johnny Piper and uh, listen to more of his lunacy and lies. I'm willing to live with that because the Bible teaches both of those things. John, for the listener who admits a need for the new birth, what is the first step in our responsibility? You say it's God's work, but what should our response be to what God has done? Well, I think if we read Jesus in John 3, where he's talking with Nicodemus about, you must be born again, and Nicodemus says, what, in order to enter into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, what, you're a Jew and you don't understand these things? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In other words, we must be born of the Spirit, not just born the first time out of the womb. And then he says, the Spirit or the wind blows where it wills, and you don't see it, but you see the effect of it. So it is with those who are born of the Spirit. So I think the first response is to say, this is God's work. He bl He said, but you, so you just heard Johnny McCarth, uh, Johnny Piper, say this he said let, let's see if i can play it back because i, I you know people lie you want to you want to go ahead and be on that lie let's see womb and then he says the spirit or the wind blows where it wills and you don't see it but you see the effect of it so it is okay the spirit like the wind blows where it wills and you don't see it but you see the effect of it that's what he just said did you not just say that you see the effect of it let's go to john 3 and let's start at John 3, 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound. Thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So did it just say you can see the effect of it? Like Johnny, like, like Johnny, uh, liar the this liar is talking about and i know people are upset because i'm you think oh you're being harsh what do you think is more harsh i mean i'm not being harsh first of all but a guy is sitting there and trying to be nice and sound nice but lie to you and give you a damnable doctrine and lying on the lord jesus christ you know and and, and impugning his character and then talking about how you are regenerated before you believe which just means basically you don't believe. You didn't believe. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to put the onus on God to save you without doing the one thing he told you to do. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 69, of sin because you believe not on me. If you don't believe that I, that I am he, you will die in your sins. 
because of unbelief, they entered, they did not enter in, right? So the one thing that you're told to do is to believe the gospel. And this guy is saying, oh, you, you're born again first. And then uh, once you're born again, you hear he doesn't even give the gospel. And then he goes on to talk about how, well, you need to respond and there should be evidences. But actually, when you go to John 3, it's, it's the very opposite of what he says. It says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. It says you cannot tell where, whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. I guess that matches when it says, uh, talks about um, the earth groaneth. And it talks about uh, waited for the manifestation of who are the sons of God. It's basically saying you actually cannot tell necessarily who, who belongs to the Lord, just based on the outward appearance. That's what it's saying. It says, thou cannot tell whence, whence it cometh and whether it goeth. Right? Obviously, you know that everyone who saves is going to heaven, so it can't be talking about that. But it's saying, based on outward appearance, you cannot tell. And when you looked at Saul, did you think Saul, who tried to kill David, did you think he was going to heaven? Up to the point where at the very end, the last thing he did was committed suicide and fell in the sword due to pride, not wanting to be killed. Did you think that uh, Samson was going to heaven throughout his life? Did you think Solomon, who had all these temples built to these the wives of this foreign, uh, the wives who has served, who worship foreign gods and had all those concubines. You think that guy is, should be going to heaven? You think David was married to a multiple wives up until his death? So don't give me this stuff about how David, quote unquote, repented of his affair with Bathsheba and all this kind of stuff. The man was married to multiple women. So, you know, the, these guys just, the problem they have is they just don't believe that you're saved because simply... You believe the gospel and, and you're saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not that's too simple. I, I can't believe that. Right? Jesus Christ, when he came upon the scene, said, you believe in God, now believe on me. And then it says, there's now, therefore, there's no name given under heaven whereby man must be saved because the mystery of God was revealed in Jesus Christ. Who, what? Who fulfilled all righteousness and fulfilled the prophecies. He is the one that the prophecy spoke of. And so once Jesus Christ came and it was made manifest his name, and of course, God the Father says, you must, you know, to get to the Father, you, you must come to the Son, right? And, you know, God chastens all whom he receives. So John Piper and these Calvinists, they, they, these guys don't even recognize the fact that you can be chastened unto, quote, unquote, sleep. You can be chastened uh, unto sleep. But they don't recognize that. These guys, um, they, they just don't, they don't even recognize that God chastens all of his sons. And they make it seem like, well, if you're not doing these works or, quote, unquote, bearing these, quote, unquote, fruit, because they don't understand that it's imputed fruit. They don't understand that it's called imputed righteousness. And imputed righteousness means it's also imputed works of Christ. They don't understand that once you're saved, you don't do works to maintain salvation. The only reason a person who is saved does works is because they already have the spirit and because they're going out and ministering to other people because they want other people to be saved. That's the work. Because just like someone gave you the gospel and you either believed it or not, you as a saved person can go out and give another person the gospel and either believe it or not. But if you don't do that, it doesn't mean you're not saved because you weren't saved by works. It's not of works. But of course, does God want you to do evil that good may come of course not he wants all of us who are saved to to live godly lives before men right that they may do what glorify their our father who is in heaven and how do they give him glory by believing the gospel right does do, do people do, do the angels rejoice in heaven of course so let's go to um first corinthians 11 because this guy doesn't seem to understand and I've heard Calvinists use this argument, this erroneous 
argument about uh, Lazarus being, well, you know, it's just like Lazarus when he was, uh, when he was, uh, when he rose from the grave. That that's the same thing with the rebirth. Well, actually, that's that's a lie. And if you read the scripture, Lazarus was a saved man because when you read that scripture, it talks about Jesus says Lazarus is sleep. And then when she didn't understand what Jesus was saying, then Jesus finally said, okay, he is dead. Because all those who are who are in Christ, they're considered sleep because as far as God's concerned with regards to the, our physical nature, we were already considered crucified with Christ. So he doesn't account our flesh and what we do in our flesh as having anything to do with, quote unquote, our salvation. Because two, again, you're not saved by the law anyway. So you don't, what, what, you don't bring the law back into accounting for anything to do with salvation. The law just simply reveals that we are guilty before God and in need of completely need grace because the law just reveals that we're, no, there's none righteous but one. That's Jesus Christ. That's why Galatians 2, 24 through 25 says the law is our schoolmaster. To bring us unto Christ, but once we've come to faith, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, right? So once you come to Christ, you're no longer under schoolmaster because you're no longer guilty of unbelief. You've been born again, just like Ephesians 1.13 says, after you heard the gospel of your salvation and believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession, right? So that makes sense. And then in the First Corinthians 11 talks about Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, hmm, unworthily, what does that mean? That means you're going around abusing the grace of God, right? That means you're going around and you're, uh, you know, yielding to your flesh, which is full of sin. Shall be guilty of the body of the blood of the Lord. Why are they guilty of the body of the blood of the Lord? Because the Christ died for your sins and you're abusing that, abusing that. What does that mean? He died for your sins, and then yet you're going to do the very thing that, for the reason why he came and died for you, you know? So he said, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Right? Damnation meaning what? Your flesh. And it goes on to explain that saying, for this cause... Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Many sleep. Funny thing, you go to the gospel in 1 Corinthians um, 15. And when Apostle Paul is giving the gospel, for I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. That's what they're called their brothers, meaning they're in Christ and they're fallen asleep because they're already considered, they were considered dead to the flesh before they actually physically died. So, again, Johnny Piper, Calvinists don't seem to understand this. So I'm going to go on those who are born of the Spirit. So I think the first response is to say, this is God's work. He blows where he wills. And then if I were talking to that person, I'd say, you know, right now in our conversation, there is evidence that the wind is blowing right now because you wouldn't be burdened, you wouldn't be concerned, you wouldn't be convicted, you wouldn't be interested if the Spirit were not blowing. And therefore, take this initiative that God has wrought in your life and use it to close with Christ. Come to Christ. Come to the cross and reach out, as it were, by the arms of your heart. Wait a minute. Now this is this is beyond idiocy. He's now the guy just said you're born again, meaning you have God's Spirit, and he's saying that happened before you even believed, and now he's saying, okay, you're born again. Take this as an initiative to come to Christ. Is this, I mean, are you guys, I mean, this, the guy is making salvation a process. He's basically saying, one, one, you don't have to really believe, right? You, you're born again, and then 
you believe, but then the proof of your belief is that you take this initiative and you quote unquote come come to Christ, cling to Christ. Uh, what happens to he that worketh not but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly? What happens to after you heard and believed the gospel of your salvation, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession? Doesn't say you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and uh, by the Holy Spirit of promise, you'll you'll do some works and uh, continue doing good works. See, he just you got to understand that Satan is not going to come to you and just. You know, he's not going to come coughing at the mouth, vomiting up green fluid, you know, and and, and doing a 360 and, and making his eyes twirl around, you know, with bad breath and bad skin and acne. Like, he's not going to do that. He's going to come as an angel of light. And he's going to try to sound very pious. He's going to be very flattering. Think about, think about um, Satan in the garden. Right when he was trying to tempt Jesus, and think about what he was saying. Was it was it was it anything mean about what he said? Was there anything where you think, "Wow, how can you say that?" No, it all sounded, "Hey, aren't you hungry? Why don't you turn these stones to bread? Hey, why why don't you you know do this? You know, it's all very flattering stuff. You know." And that's exactly what this guy is doing. But it is amazing. I mean, it's amazing that these guys can get away with this stuff. And people, you know, it's like he's basically saying the one thing God told you to do to be saved, he's saying, you know, you don't do that. You're born again first. And then God, quote, unquote, gives you, quote, unquote, faith, which would defeat the purpose of God sending anyone to hell for not believing. Because if God gave you faith. And God restrained other people from even believing, then that would make God the author of sin because anything done out of faith is a sin. And if God didn't allow you or kept other people from believing, that would mean God Himself is the one who is causing them to sin. I mean, do you get that logic? That that do you get that the reasoning from the scriptures? It makes absolutely no sense. So let's listen further as he basically says, you know, even though the guy claims that you're regenerated and born again, of course, like a true satanic preacher, he's going to basically say, oh, well, okay, you're regenerated, right? And so the regeneration was so that you can believe. And God, quote, unquote, gave you this faith to believe. Now, if you really believe, that's going to be, quote, quote, manifested by you coming to Christ and then finally one day somewhere in the future you'll be saved and you know I know this is all a mystery but we'll just have to resolve it in heaven yeah when you're standing in front of the great white throne judgment and God says depart from me you work of iniquity I never knew you because you listen to this uh, John Piper who recommended John Edwards who um, gave you a false gospel and a false Christ will and embrace Christ as Savior and Lord. And then you admit, I was got to this point, I was brought to this point by the Spirit of God, flattery, and flattery, yet now flattery. I must use my will, enabled by God, to embrace, to receive, like the Bible says, many, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. So we must... Did you catch that? See how Calvinists did that? So they try to get around the verses to many as receive him, to him gave him power to become the children of God, the sons of God. So the way they get around that is they have to do this thing where they talk about you're regenerated so that they can say, see, you couldn't even, you couldn't even believe, right? Well, here's the thing. Here's another thing that makes absolutely no sense. Well, okay. If, didn't God say he makes all things new? Didn't he say it's old things are passed away, he makes all things new? Well, if old things are passed away and all things are new, then why why do how do they teach progressive sanctification? Think about that. If old is passed away and all things are new, and 
you know, I'm saying that the Bible is basically saying that once you're born again, basically you're born of the one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, and you're in Christ. And it, that says gives you a new heart. That heart is the heart of Christ because you're in Christ, the household of God. And I'm saying that's what that means because you're in Christ. And Christ is before you, and Christ walked the perfect walk, and God is looking at you as if you are his son, Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. But that's why you're sealed in Jesus Christ. We are one in Christ. So that's all the, the Bible actually explains it, and it actually makes sense. And because of that, that spirit does not sin, right? And because you're in Christ, who did not sin, and then died as if he did sin, he could then turn around and give you the righteousness, uh, the give you his righteousness, but that righteousness isn't given to you until you do one thing. Believe the gospel message. Right? And that's not double jeopardy because you're not, Christ saved you from the, the, the sin debt of the law whereby all men will surely have gone to hell and says, no, you don't go to hell because of the law. I paid for that. I fulfilled and paid for sins according to the law. Now the sin is John 69 of sin because you believe not on me. And if you believe on me, thusly, you're born again and sealed in and you are of my spirit. Which completely makes sense and have access to the Father. But Calvinists don't recognize that, that verse that way. They don't even look at it that way. They don't look at you're crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. They don't look at Colossians 3, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. They, don't, they ignore those verses. They try to explain away those verses, right? And so what he's saying absolutely makes no sense, and he's just making up stuff. Receive this Christ in order to have the stamp of adoption and belonging to God put on us. So I would say to the person, did you hear that? That you have the stamp of adoption put up on us. Ephesians 1, 12 through 14 talks about you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. After you heard and believe the gospel, you're sealed. Ephesians 2, 18 says, after you receive the Spirit, it says, now you're no more strangers, but saints, right? Fellow citizens in the household of God. How in the world is he talking about some, you'll finally receive the stamp? I'm telling you, these guys are demonic. You need to, if your Calvinism is demonic, Arminianism is demonic. Jehovah Witnesses, SDA, I don't care if this one says they're necessarily a Baptist or whatever they say they are. Do not listen to their quote-unquote title as far as that. You need to go to their statement of faith and you just ask them one, this one question. What must I do to be saved? Ask them, what is the gospel? And then say, if I believe that gospel, can I lose my salvation for any reason? If they start giving you this, well, mm, uh, the gospel is, and they start saying stuff like, oh, the gospel is repent from sins. It's, like, it's not repent from sin. It's repent and believe. If it was repent from sin, then that would make the sentence not make any sense. Because if repent means turn from sin, then why would you say add from sin? Because if it's inherent in the word, then why would you have to add that in from sin in it? So repent does not mean from sin. It's, it's repent and believe. Right? You don't believe, so you need to believe. Uh, so that's, you know, a, an obvious lie if you really think about it. If, if repent means turn from sin, then why do you need to say repent from sin? Right? But if eating donuts, if, 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 I, if, if repent mean, meant eat donuts, why would I say repent and eat donuts? I would just say repent. And you'd be like, oh, eat donuts? You'd be like, it, it completely makes sense. Why be redundant? Why say it twice? But, you know, people brainwash you and they inundate you so many times and just drill into you the lies and then you just, you just, you just can't, you just, you're, after a while you're not even thinking, especially if you're not reading the Bible on your own. Because if you're always just looking at the Bible through the lens of you know, their sermons, and then you got your Bible cracked open going along with them instead of just reading the Bible by yourself, no commentary, KJV, then you're going to be deceived. 
You're just going to be deceived. That's just a fact. You know? Uh, so let's go on. Come. Come to Christ. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without... What in the heck is he talking about? Didn't the guy just said you have the spirit before you even believe? And then if you have the spirit, then you... Is Christ... I'm, I'm sorry. Is Christ divided? How do you have the spirit? And now the guy's talking about come after you have the spirit. If you have the spirit, you, where are you coming to? If you have the spirit, that means you're in Christ. I mean, this guy is like contradicting himself. Uh, I, am, I am baffled. And by the way, I'm looking at this video, 2,340 2, views on it. Uh, it had all thumbs up until I thumbed it down. I have one, one thumb down, one thumbs down by me. Right? One thumbs down by me. And then, of course, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's just amazing. Price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread? In other words, I would just plead with people, come to Christ as the fountain of living water and the bread of heaven. And when they come, they embrace with faith. They're saved. Their sins are forgiven. They have the hope of eternal life. When they come and embrace with faith, then their sins are forgiven. The guy just made salvation a, a process and a journey. And he just made it. He, here's what he just did. Here's, here's the, what this guy just did. And you, you got to really catch this. He said, man's heart starts out of stone, which is a lie. Man has a stony heart. He says, because man's heart is made of stone, he says, you got to be regenerated. And then he says, after you regenerate it, then you finally get faith. And he says, that faith is a saving faith. And then he says, once you get that faith, you will come to God. And then once you come to God, you'll get that stamp of adoption if you continue to come in faith and embrace the cross, which basically means if you come and obey, then you will be finally saved. But yet, the Bible just says, believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. It calls it the gospel of your salvation. It talks about how Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. By the gospel, by which you are saved, right? Right? The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish, but to those of us who are saved is the power of God. But this guy just doesn't, he just does not believe it. He's claiming to believe it, but he doesn't believe it. And he's confused and he's blind. And they will look back someday and say, I came because he drew me. I came because I was born again. He opened my eyes. He gave me ears to hear. He enabled me to taste and see that the Lord is good. If you have a question for John Piper, send it to us. The address is radio at desiringgod.org. Radio. Yeah. If you got a question for John Piper, you should ask him, why is he a Pharisee? Why is he heretical? Uh, why is he um, a false teacher? And that's that's the question you should have for John Piper, because John Piper um, basically just lied about everything that you just you just saw. That was just just straight lies. So it's it's pretty sad that that's um, what people are believing. But you know, Calvinists will sit there and they'll tell you they say, "Well, are you saying that your will supersedes God as if it's as if it's a contradiction?" First of all, here's here's why it's not a contradiction. It says God wills that all men be saved, all men come to the knowledge of the truth, right? And in that case, that will is talking about God's desire, right? But then it also talks about in the scriptures, it says, this is the will of the Father that all that see the Son believe on him, right? And it talks about he will raise him up, right? So that is the will of the Father, to save everyone who believes. Is it the will of the Father to save everyone who doesn't believe? No. God desires that all men believe, but he, he's going to save those who believe. Is he going to save the ones who do not believe? Of course not, because that's a sin, to not believe, right? But to, if that's a sin, not to not believe, that would make no sense for uh, God the Father and Jesus Christ uh, at the great right throne judgment to say, you guys are going to be cast in hell for not believing uh, the gospel if, according to the Calvinists, 
Jesus Christ didn't die for them in the first place, it would actually be a sin for them to believe it. But yet the scripture says of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I return to the Father, uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So that would make no sense at all. Secondly, what is the purpose? What, what reason has the son, was the Son of God made manifest? Scriptures say, for this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Question for you: Are the works of the devil destroyed? Yes, they're already destroyed. Sin, when it sin, when it fulfills itself, bringing forth what death? Did Jesus conquer death? Of course. So Jesus says, "You're either for me or against me." So every man has this choice. So he's saying, "You know what? It's just like the ark." This world is, is the prince of this world is judged. I'm already telling you uh, that um, this world is going to melt away in a fervent heat. I'm already telling you that those who don't believe will be cast into the lake of fire. I'm already warning you. What's he warning them about if they have no chance to believe? That that's the, the dumbest and this the dumbest thing ever. What is he warning them about? Hebrews 4.2, the gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us, but did not profit them being not mixed with faith. Okay, Calvinists, you have to just be saying God's a liar. How can the gospel not profit them only because it was not mixed in faith in them that heard it? If it wouldn't matter, if, if, if they believed it, according to you, it would be a lie because he didn't die for them. Seriously, think about that. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us, but it did not profit them being not mixed with faith. Wait a minute. I thought Christ didn't die for them. So why did they mix, mix it with faith? That's like saying, I need you to believe what Christ didn't do for you, but it didn't profit you because you didn't believe it, but it's a lie anyway. But that's the only reason it didn't profit you is because you didn't believe a lie. That makes God the liar. I mean, it's just the dumbest thing ever. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, you know, I know we wrestle not with flesh and blood. It's just, it's frustrating to see um, people just stop pretending that you're reading the Bible on your own when it's very obvious that you're not. Stop pretending you're like, oh, I'm, I'm being a Berean. You're not. You can't say you're being a Berean when you're falling for this, this obvious stupid lies over and over again. You know, but you know, stop claiming you're 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 being a Berean when you're not. So, um, and and by the way, when we the reason these videos are made is because God loves you. It is not making these videos to just criticize Calvinism. You know, people have families and all this stuff. That they love and they could be doing other things to spend their time but we understand that you know this if you die in in unbelief you're going to go to hell and you're going to be in hell for for eternity you're going to spend eternally you're going to be in hell and so it's there's so much at stake but if you want to be proud and you want to listen to these guys because they got phd after their name and they start using words that you know, oh the word it sounds so impressive and you want to do that and you want to buy their books well, okay, you just like a Jehovah Witness or an SDA. I mean, you these supplemental books. Nobody told you to buy a study Bible. Study by the first study Bibles were the earliest forms of ways for people to get, try to get heresy into the scriptures. Is they're saying, oh, well, let me tell you what it means. No, you shouldn't have no any study Bible. Some other man telling you this is the interpretation. No. Keep studying on your own. You're going to see things that you think contradict, but then you just keep on reading, and after a while you say, okay, I see how that makes sense. It's not what I thought. But if you just think it doesn't make sense to me, thusly, I'm going to go to some other man and explain it away to me, you're never going to get to the, the uh, right, you're never going to rightly divide it because you're always going to some other man to tell you, and, and, and they're going to have some system of heresy. And then they're going to be, well, that's just one of those great mysteries. I guess we'll have to find out when we get before God. Oh, you're going to find out when you get before God, all right. Jesus, now, you didn't die for everyone. Really? So how did the gospel preach unto them as well unto us, but it didn't profit them being not mixed in faith and them that heard it? That's funny. Right? And how is the Holy Spirit reproving the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment 
And then I go and see in the same paragraph, I say, because the prince of this world is judged. So when you saw world written there twice in that in that um, paragraph, in that passage, so was Satan just the prince of what? Not the world? I mean, it's just... You, it's just I'm telling you, there's just so many ways to prove these guys are wrong, but it's so hard because um, people just seem to want to believe the lie. Um, so what I was trying to prove was that, okay, so this question about God's quote-unquote sovereignty being thwarted. Okay, one, Jesus Christ has already destroyed the works of the devil in the sense that he's already conquered sin in the grave. And what's the last thing that's going to be put away? Death, right? Last thing he's going to be thrown in the lake of fire is death. So Jesus already conquered sin. He's already conquered death. He's already conquered the grave. So for this reason, the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Question. For those who believe, they're what? They're crucified with Christ, and um, they're already considered dead. Right? So is death going to affect them? No. They will never die. Right? They have life. Now, for those who don't believe the gospel, does that mean the works of the devil aren't destroyed? No, because they will be thrown in the lake of fire along with death. So either way, you have not thwarted God's you have not thwarted God's sovereignty in that aspect. Two, does God will to save those who do not believe the gospel? No. Does God will to save those who do believe the gospel? Yes. Is God willing that any should perish? And, hope, and he says that, he, that he, he wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth? He desires that, yes. Does God force you to believe the gospel? No. Unlike Calvinists who teach it, he doesn't. That would make Hebrews 4.2 nonsensical. That would make, uh, to he that worketh not but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, nonsensical. Right? Now, the other thing is, did, did Jesus Christ fulfill the law? And when he fulfilled the law, was he, is he not the savior of all men? Because without, if Jesus Christ hadn't fulfilled the law, then all men would go to hell for one reason. Because they're all guilty of the law. But does anyone go to hell because they're guilty of the law? Or do people go to hell because they don't believe on Jesus Christ to save them from their sin because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and now they don't believe on Jesus Christ? John 16, 9, of sin because they believe not on me. Well, they go to hell, not because of the law. It's because Jesus Christ saved all men from the law. Right? So he's the savior of all men. Especially of them that believe. Because them that believe, they he saved us from the law already. Now he's saying the sin is unbelief. So you believe on Jesus Christ, you are saved. You're still with the Holy Spirit of promise. So yes, he's the savior of all men. Now, has God now shown his mercy for all men? Yes. Is it God's is God mercy thwarted because all men don't believe the gospel? No. Because he's already he's died for their sins. It's just that they didn't believe on him, and so thusly they perish because of unbelief. Is that God's fault that they didn't believe? He still died for their sins, according to the law. But he said, Now you just need to believe on me. Well, you refuse to give God his glory, thusly you're not saved. According to the gospel. So God has shown his justice in the sense that he, God's wrath was appeased. And, he, and, and, and God didn't just say, well, I'm just going to forgive people of their sins, but I'm not going to, but no one's going to have to pay for that sin. Well, that's why Jesus Christ came, died on the cross. He fulfilled the law. But righteousness doesn't come by the law. If righteousness came by the law, then Christ has died in vain. So he fulfilled his justice in, in Christ. So that he may what? Show what? Mercy. Right? But that's already been fulfilled. Now, the fact that you reject it has nothing to do with what Christ has already done. He's already fulfilled. He's destroyed the works of the devil. So either you can be reborn again, believe the gospel and be born again, or you can partner with the devil, inside with the devil, and then you'll just be thrown in the lake of fire where you'll be where death will be and you will be and you'll burn in eternity. Right? So that's done. Whether you, it's not a question, it's what are you going to do? What, you, what are you going to do? Are you going to believe God or not?
right? Has he shown his mercy to, to all men? Of course, yes. He's died on the cross for all men. So his justice is fulfilled, his mercy is shown, and he wills to save all who believe. He doesn't will to save those who don't believe on him. Because that's not a relationship. Why is God called, referring to us as a family? Right? So this whole lie that uh, you're usurping God's sovereignty is wrong. God perfectly fulfilled his justice, perfectly fulfilled his mercy, right? Either way, if only if no one believed the gospel, God still perfectly showed his mercy and perfectly showed his justice because he died for all men perfectly and he fulfilled the law and he took the penalty of the law. But it's not that's not why men go to hell. Men go to hell because they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's merciful. That's fulfilling his justice. Just because men don't believe it, if no one believed it, if God, let God be true and every man be, uh, all, let God be true and all men, every man a liar. It doesn't matter whether all men believe it or no men believe it. God still is shown is shown his righteousness, his justice, and his mercy. And the fact that men reject it or that men sin, all that does is. All it does is the, the light just shows God's holiness, right? That's all it does, his perfect holiness. So um, don't let these Calvinists lie to you. You know, they're, they're just liars. Another important point is, what does the scripture say? It says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, right? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, right? Um, so all believers call upon the name of the Lord before they they die, before they physically die, right? So our knees bow and our tongues confess before we die. Now, the people who do not believe the gospel, those who do not call upon the Lord before, there's, uh, before they die, then they die in unbelief. They die in their sins. And because they die in the, that sin of unbelief, um, at the great white throne judgment, that's when their knee is going to bow and their tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So either way, again, God's sovereignty is not thwarted because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all men, having fulfilled the law that showed perfect mercy. God punished sin, poured out his wrath on his son, Jesus Christ, right? That showed his justice, and his justice is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, the sin is unbelief. So those who do not believe on Jesus Christ, who do not believe on his sacrifice, and the fact that he paid for their sins, now they're guilty of the body of Christ. They're guilty of rejecting Jesus Christ. Thusly, they are thrown into the lake of fire with death. And thus, that justice is fulfilled because instead of taking the justice that was the um, imputed justice um, that Jesus paid for them, they now have decided to reject Jesus. And thus, they are um, took their part and have their part in the lake of fire with the devil. Right? So, the scriptures show that God's mercy is fulfilled, God's justice is fulfilled, and everyone will, um, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The saved do it before they, they, they die. They call upon the Lord to be saved. The damned, will their knees bow and their tongue confess to Jesus Christ the Lord after they die. But unfortunately, is appointed man once to die, then the judgment. The people who call upon the name of the Lord, they're already considered dead and they're judged with the righteousness of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin that we may be made the righteousness of God through him, right? But if you don't believe on him, then you don't become the righteousness of God because you didn't believe. And thusly, um, your opponent wants to die in the judgment. And what are you judge? You're guilty of not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 69, of sin because you believe not on me. So that's how, when it, when it's, when it says, um, who can lay charge to God's elect? It's because, look, you can't lay charge to God's elect because they're judged with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right? And, and when you can say, well, how, who, is, who has resisted his will? Well, that's what it means when it says who has resisted his will. Well, he wills to save those who believe on his son, 
right? He does not will to save those who do not believe on his son. But he also, he's every he people will every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His justice will be fulfilled, whether you take the justice and the fulfillment and the wrath that was uh, that was um, paid by Jesus Christ, or you reject that and then you take your part in the lake of fire. So you say, well, well yeah, you're right. For so. Did you thwart God's will? No. Did Jesus destroy the, for this reason the Son of Man was made the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil? Was that thwarted? No. Right? If the works of the devil are destroyed if you're born again in Christ, the works of the devil are going to be destroyed if you're thrown in the lake of fire. Death is going to be put away, sin is going to be put away. God's sovereignty is not thwarted. So Calvinists, again, are doing a straw man, they're liars, they're confused, they don't know what they're talking about. And uh don't be deceived by these guys. They are false. John Piper is false. Calvinism is false. Armenian is false. There's so many false religions. There's one way to be saved. Believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I pray that you receive the gospel. If you have fallen for this Calvinism, and I understand because I, I got caught up and listened to these guys and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, just believe the gospel. Believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day to save you from your sins. And you are saved. You can never lose it after you believe you're sealed with the holy spirit of promise right until the redemption of the purchase of possessions now therefore you are no more strangers but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of god right that's it that's it so for john piper to be like well you know you get the spirit but then you got to clean well okay john piper why are you called the son of god after you get the spirit and after you call the son of god that means god knows you so if God knows you, how in the world could he then, in Matthew, when he says, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, didn't I do, and this is what John MacArthur is talking about, you got you to gotta demonstrate, you got to take initiative. Well, okay, that initiative is called doing works. So many will come to me that day saying, Lord, didn't I do many what? Good works. Cast out demons, do all this stuff in your name. They're not saying they didn't believe. Uh and do things in his name, they were coming to do works, and he says, depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. Why? Because you can't, it's, it's not of works. The he that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So please, don't fall for this lie of Calvinism. Um, so I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, who, who, uh, died for my sin, was buried, rose again the third day. And if you believe that, you're saved. God wants, desires all men be saved. Um, you know, don't be foolish. Just believe the gospel. You know, better to be a son and be chastised than not be a son at all. Because I tell you what, it's appointed man once to die, then the judgment. That's another thing. Appointed man once to die, then the judgment. According to Calvinists, you're already, you're already judged. You're already convicted. You know, you're convicted because there's no chance you believe in. But why do they stand before the great white throne judgment then? It makes absolutely no sense. So, um, you know, don't fall for this lie of Calvinism. It, it's a demonic heresy, and it clouds itself in, um, you know, shiny, big 25-cent words, 50-cent words, you know, and PhDs and writing books and saying sincerity. And uh, these guys, you notice how they're all trying to sell books. They're peddling. You, you go to them and you say, well, where is that in the Bible about you selling books? Show me that in the scriptures, hypocrite. Can't find it. Nowhere in the scriptures to be found. But yet they're doing it. But but you supposedly you gotta obey, right? They don't obey, but they supposedly you you're supposed to obey. I guess that's when Jesus told the Pharisees, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. He doesn't want you to sacrifice. That's why Jesus is the Lamb of God. He gave his sacrifice, which is perfect, so he says he'll have mercy. So you just need to believe and you add what the thief on the cross do? Ask for mercy. What did the what did the publican do? Have mercy on me, a sinner. Who went away justified? The publican. Not the Pharisee. I thank God the Pharisee said, I'm not like other men. I do this. Right? He talked about what he didn't do and what he did do. So basically he's saying, hey, I don't do these sins. And I do do these good works. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. 
not of works. And uh, by the way, they talk about, oh, you can boast. Why did you believe and another person believe? Uh, everyone who will be in heaven will be there for the same reason. So it'll be because they believe and it'll be because they were drawn by the spirit. Love and kindness have I drawn thee. And they all believe. So where's the, where's the boasting going to be? Oh, you believe? I believe too. You believe? I believe too. How? Yeah, Christ drew me. And I believe. So saying they can't boast before men, well, the other men who go to hell because they didn't believe, that's amongst men. But that's not boasting before God. So um, that that's just another um, straw man. And uh, I really do pray that you just receive the gospel. Believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day to save you from your sins. And you are saved. Uh, praise my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.